Okay, I've written down a couple of formulas for antiderivatives of particular types of functions that we have already. We've got our power rule. If I'm integrating x to a fixed power, I raise the power by 1, divide by the new power, and of course we add c. And of course this only works if n is not negative 1, because if n was negative 1, that would put a 0 in the denominator. So then we have a special rule for what if n is negative 1, x to the negative 1 is just the reciprocal function. And we saw that the general antiderivative of that is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Really common mistake to leave off the absolute value, so be very cautious about that. Okay. I want to add to the list of rules, and I want to start with one that we talked about at the end of the last video. If I let m be a constant, and I integrate m with respect to x. Now there's a reason I chose m to represent my arbitrary constant. That's because I'm thinking of it as the slope. Because here we're saying the derivative is constant. The sorts of things that have constant derivatives are lines, which have constant slopes. So my general antiderivative is just going to be a line of slope m. So m times x would give me a line through the origin. I add an arbitrary constant to it. If I were to call that constant b instead of c, I'd say, oh yeah, I'm getting a line of slope m because I'm getting mx plus b. I'm just calling the, the, y, the y value of the y-intercept c here instead. Okay. So I like to think of that as geom a geometric argument, that if I have a constant, I'm just going to get a line with that slope. We did see that I could view this as m copies of x to the 0 because x to the 0 is just 1. So if I wanted to, I could view this as a combination of the constant multiple rule, because I'm multiplying by m, and the power rule, because then I would just say this is m copies of x to the first over 1 plus c, which is mx plus c. So however you want to get there, if you integrate a constant, you get that constant times x plus c. Notice that rule applies even if my constant is 0. So if I integrate 0, according to this, I should get a line of slope 0, which would just be 0x plus c. If I integrate 0, I get a constant. Now if I think about that geometrically, what sorts of lines have a constant slope of 0? Well, lines of course have constant slope, but what sorts of lines have a slope of 0? Horizontal lines, which are just constant functions. <laughs> So if you're integrating 0, you do get something, because you always get that plus c. And geometrically, essentially, that's telling us, hey, yeah, the sorts of things that have a slope of 0, those would be horizontal lines, which are constant functions. So kind of neat. OK. Let's take a look at some other types of functions. Let's look at some exponential functions. So if I wanted to integrate or find an antiderivative for e to the x, I want to think, do I know a function whose derivative is e to the x? And I'm thinking I do. I'm thinking it would be e to the x. I'm going to, just to confirm that, I'm going to guess e to the x. I'm going to check if I take the derivative of e to the x. Yup, I get e to the x. So if I'm integrating e to the x, I'm going to get e to the x plus c. Okay. You still have to add that plus c. Now, what if I'm integrating b to the x, where this is an exponential function, so my base is a positive number, and it's not 1. Because remember, for exponential functions, we said the base either has to be between 0 and 1 or bigger than 1. Okay. Well, I know with exponential functions, when I take the derivative, I get the exponential function back. But if the base is an e, I get more than that. But I'm going to go ahead with my guess and check method. I'm going to guess b to the x. Now, I think this is going to be off but close. So I'm going to check if I take the derivative of b to the x. Remember, when we take the derivative of an exponential function, we always get that exponential function back. It's just if the base is not e, we also get this extra factor of the natural log of the base. Now, if the base is e, the natural log of e happens to be 1. 
So we still get that, it just doesn't make any difference. Okay. So it looks like here, I wanted to get this, I've got this extra thing, but this is just a constant. That's a funny looking constant. People are sometimes like, ooh, that's a natural log, that's a complicated function, but this isn't the natural log of x. This is the natural log of b, which is a fixed number. So its natural log is a fixed number. So I can adjust. I'm going to try 1 over the natural log of b times b to the x. And I know that this will not be 0, because remember we said for an exponential function, the base isn't allowed to be 1, and 1 is the only number whose natural log would be 0. Okay. So if I check. If I take the derivative of 1 over the natural log of b times b to the x, I'm going to get 1 over the natural log of b times the natural log of b times b to the x. Those natural logs cancel, and I just get b to the x. So I get 1 over the natural log of b times b to the x plus c. Okay. So with an exponential function, you get if you take the derivative, you get the exponential function back multiplied by the natural log of the base. If you integrate or take an antiderivative of an exponential function, you get the exponential function back divided by the natural log of the base. And then, of course, plus our arbitrary constant. Okay, so those are our exponential functions. Okay. I haven't talked about trig functions yet, so let's try that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write six integrals on the board, and I'm going to encourage you then to pause the video and do the ones that you can do and mark the ones that we don't know how to do yet. Because it's tempting to think, oh, we know all the derivatives of the trig function, so we must know all the antiderivatives. We don't. So I'm going to write down the integrals of the six trig functions. And I want you to evaluate them if you can, and just recognize that we haven't seen this before if you can't. Okay. okay, so those are the six integrals. I want you to do the ones that you can, admit defeat temporarily on the ones that we don't know how to do yet. And the hint is, if you've seen that function showing up as the derivative, you should be able to guess the, an antiderivative. But if you haven't seen that function show up as the derivative, then we don't know how to take an antiderivative. Okay, give it a shot. Welcome back. These are the only two that we can easily do by inspection. Because while I know how to take the derivative of tangent of x, I have not really seen tangent showing up as the derivative of some other function. Unless you're remembering an obscure homework problem in the past, and maybe you are. I mean, we could have seen that, but we don't see it on a regular basis. Same thing with secant, cosecant, and cotangent. I know how to take the derivatives, but we haven't really seen a function where that is the derivative of that function. <laughs> now with sine and cosine, these are the two that I should be able to do. So with this, we need more tools. Some of which we'll get this semester, some of which you don't get until 3b. Okay, But with sine, let's make a guess. I could guess cosine of x, and then I could check. So I could say, what's the derivative of cosine of x? That would be negative sine x. So I got what I wanted, but I got this extra negative sign, so I'll adjust. Let's guess negative cosine of x. That way, when I check that, the derivative of negative cosine of x is negative negative sine x, which is just sine x. Okay. So antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine of x plus c. Now it's really easy to make a mistake here, okay? Because when I take the derivative of sine, there's no negative sign in the formula. 
when I take an antiderivative of sine, there is a negative sign in the formula because I'm going in the opposite direction, okay? So what I often do is I sort of remember sine and cosine go together. I'm more familiar with the derivative rules than the antiderivative rules. So I write down what I think it is and then I just do a quick mental check. If I took the derivative of that, oh yeah, because I know when there's a co in the name, I'm going to get a negative sign in the formula, so it would be negative, negative sine x, I just get sine x. Okay. For cosine x, let's guess. Let's guess sine x. Let's check. And the derivative of sine x, oh, excellent. That is just cosine x. I don't need to adjust that one. So this is just going to be sine of x plus c. Now, I mentioned that these other trig functions, we really haven't seen showing up as the derivatives of things. But that doesn't mean that my knowledge of the derivatives of the other trig functions isn't going to be helpful. I know, for example, that the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared x. That means even though I don't know at this point how to integrate secant, I do know how to integrate secant squared. That's just going to be tangent of x plus c. So I can recognize, oh, that's the derivative of tangent, so I know how to integrate it. Similarly, I know that the derivative of secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. So I may not know how to integrate secant or tangent by themselves, but if I see the integral of secant of x times tangent of x, I know that's going to be secant of x plus c, because I recognize that's the derivative of secant. Excellent. Now, I know that the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. We're more often going to see cosecant squared than negative cosecant squared. Okay. But I can sort of adjust that. I can say, oh, that's the opposite of the derivative of cotangent. So when I integrate, I should get the opposite of cotangent plus c. And then I can quickly check. If I take the derivative of negative cotangent, I get negative, negative cosecant squared. The two negatives cancel, and so that works. Similarly, I know that the derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant of x cotangent of x. Generally, the integral version of that that we'll see is the integral of cosecant doesn't matter what order, cosecant x cotangent of x dx. And I look at that and I say that's the opposite of the derivative of cosecant. So I'm going to get the opposite of cosecant of x plus c. Okay. So there are six trig integrals that we get from knowing the derivatives of the six trig functions. It's just that we're not necessarily integrating just the trig functions. We're integrating the functions that are the derivatives, or in some cases, the opposite of the derivatives of those trig functions.